These scripture stories were chosen to be read today because they lift up a theme that instigated a a major paradigm shift in the church. 500 years ago, in the midst of a church that was locked into a fearful and transactional view of God, a God who punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous, a monk dared to question the religious authorities of his day and suggest another way of understanding our relationship with God. He did so having been convinced by these stories and others like them in Scripture, that God was not waiting to punish him for his misdeeds, but in fact was instead anxious to show him mercy in spite of and even through his sins. What Martin Luther taught and preached and wrote about helped begin the reformation of the church. So now here we are, half a millennium later, reformed, right? We have been freed, haven't we? St. John makes a little joke in his story today. As Jesus talks to these new disciples of his, who happen to be Jewish, about freedom, they respond, we are descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. The punchline is that uh, the defining moment of Jewish heritage is the Exodus, right? To be a descendant of Abraham is to be defined by slavery. Every year at Passover, they remember their ancestors. They remember that their ancestors were slaves in Egypt and how God brought them out. But at the same time, what those people say is correct, right? That's all in the past. They'd already been freed from slavery in Egypt. They'd been given the law in Mount Sinai and set free. Their ancestors had been slaves, but this generation never had. And so they asked Jesus, quite understandably, from what they need to be freed. And what he spends the rest of the chapter trying to tell them is that although they have been freed, that's not the same as being free. They are still enslaved to a limiting, even to a damaging view of God and themselves. And the result of this, he goes on to say, is that even as God's own son stands in front of them, they cannot recognize him because they don't really know who God is. Boy, that's a damning realization, isn't it? As I read these words in the gospel reading today, I have to ask, if Jesus were to walk into this church today, would we know who he is? Would we listen to what he has to say? Or would we, like these Judeans, believe that he was crazy? sometimes wonder if we really know who God is. I say that partly because I still speak with people regularly who have been so hurt and so damaged by what they have heard in churches, even Lutheran churches, that they cannot bring themselves to believe in a God at all, or that if God exists, that that God is good. And that makes me wonder if we are just as limited in our understanding of God as the church 500 years ago. But mostly I say that because I wonder if we are also enslaved to a single way of understanding what church means. Even after the seismic cultural shift of the COVID shutdown, we still have it in our heads that the only way to be church is to show up in a building regularly, even if that showing up is digital. We still believe that worship is limited to what happens on a Sunday morning or the odd Wednesday evening. We still believe that the only way for a congregation to grow and thrive is to increase membership and programming. When we fail to do those things or meet those measures, we worry that we're doing it wrong, that we are failing God or our children or ourselves. To me, that sounds like its own kind of legalism. When Jesus speaks to these Judean folks who had begun to accept his message, he says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They failed to comprehend what he meant because they couldn't imagine of what they might need to be freed. So maybe that's the first question to ask ourselves on this Reformation Sunday. From what do we need to be freed? What is it that oppresses us as a community of believers? 
or even as a community of citizens. Maybe it's religious legalism and parochialism, or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a fear of death, a fear of irrelevance, a, a uh, concern that we don't have the esteem we once had in society. Maybe it's our anxiety over trying to change the world for the better. Maybe it's the absolute certainty that there are people out there, non-believers or criminals or email scammers, people from the other political party, that there are people out there who are genuinely evil and wish to do us harm and to damage our society. Jesus says that the truth will set these people free, but it's interesting to note that to them the truth looks like blasphemy, doesn't it? When he speaks the truth to them, they pick up stones to throw at him. And that makes me wonder, what if the places and the people that we call sinful might actually hide the truth of God? What if we can't recognize God in these people or in these situations or settings because we don't really know who God is? The thing from which Jesus says we need to be free, set free, is sin. Now to those Jewish folks to whom he's talking, sin means disobedience to God's law. It means the misdeeds that we commit, immoral actions or attitudes that run contrary to God's will. But if you read John's Gospel, you find that when Jesus talks about sin, he's talking about something else entirely. He speaks about sin not as an action, but as a state of being. He likens it to darkness or blindness. In John's Gospel, sin is the state of being separated from God, the condition of not knowing who God is. Jesus says the truth he brings has the power to heal us from this condition, like restoring sight to a blind person. It has the power to set us free, to transform us from slaves who abide in the house only at the pleasure of the householder, to family who abide in a house forever. And that truth, if we read on, we find is Jesus himself. Jesus who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The truth is the life that Jesus lives, life lived in a loving, mutual, abiding relationship that he has with the Father, a relationship that he opens and extends to include us. Now compare that to the transactional, conditional, parochial relationship we so often have with God one that's based on right behavior or right belief, one that is colored by our own inflated or withered sense of our own worth. Unlike us, Jesus knows where he stands with God, and he knows that he is one with the Father, not because of who he is, but because of who God is. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and so all are now justified by God's grace as a gift. If that's true, is it really possible for anyone or anything to be completely evil, completely unworthy of love, completely outside of the God who created it? I begin to wonder if as long as we hold on to that idea that there's a difference between sacred and secular, between good people and bad people, between the righteous and the wicked, we will forever fail to recognize God in front of us. The truth I see in Jesus is that God is hidden in all people, even people like a heretical rabbi or a man being tortured to death on a cross. As long as we continue to believe that there are places or people or situations in which God is not present, maybe God will continue to have places to hide from us in the faces where we refuse to look. And I wonder if that means we will never really know who God is. 
The promise that we hear today is that the days are surely coming when we will all know God. All of us, from the least to the greatest, from the righteous to the wicked. No longer will we have to go about saying to one another, know the Lord, as if some of us did and others didn't. I wonder if one of the things Jesus must teach us is that God is hidden in all of creation. Even the darkest, dirtiest, most re repulsive parts. Even the sinful parts. And that if we are willing to brave the darkness with a loving heart and a curious mind, then perhaps we might see God revealed to us in a new way. Particularly on this Reformation Sunday, I think about this in relation to the church. I start to think what the church might look like outside buildings like this. Apart from communities who label themselves Christian or even religious, one of the biggest things that held back the people in John's story from knowing God revealed in Jesus was their own religious identity. They believed that there was one proper way to be Jewish and that apart from that, God was not present. On this day, as we celebrate our Protestant Christian identity, our Lutheran identity, I wonder, has that very identity ever kept us from seeing God? in some other place or some other people? Are we also enslaved to a too small understanding of ourselves that pulls us away from the one whom we seek? Having a sense of identity like that is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have a Jewish identity or a Lutheran identity. It's even necessary. It only becomes harmful when we believe that 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 identity is all that there is. That that identity is who we truly are or what gives us our worth. That's what happens to the people in John's story. Even though, even the folks who begin to listen to Jesus aren't able to let go of their Jewish identity enough to follow Jesus or to abide with him beyond that identity and begin to know who they truly are in God. That's what Paul is getting at in his letter. That our identity as wicked or righteous Jew or Gentile, that those things don't matter in God's eyes. They may be important to us for various reasons, but when it comes to God, those things are extraneous. There were others who did leave that identity behind and abide with Jesus. Into, who, into knowing who they truly are with God. And it is thanks to them that we are still telling these stories today. Likewise, Luther and the Reformers were able to abide in their identity in God enough to see beyond the labels of Catholic or heretic and learn to experience God in a new way. I, religious identity or identity of being a religious offers us a foundation to stand on as we seek the greater truth of who God is by whatever name that we might call God. And that and who and it offers us an opportunity to seek the truth of who we are in this greater reality. So maybe that's what it means to be set free. To be freed to leave behind what is safe and known to venture out into the great unknown, trusting in the goodness of God to keep us safe, rather than in the mighty fortresses of identity and tradition that we've constructed for ourselves. I wonder if maybe that's our challenge today. To venture out in love beyond the walls of those fortresses so that we might come to know the Lord and to love the Lord's people in a new way.